The scripture that I'll be reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good, very rarely will anyone die for an unrighteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What are you waiting for? This season, this Advent season, these weeks leading up to Christmas are traditionally associated with waiting. We wait. Most years we wait to celebrate Christmas. If you have young kids in the household, you understand that fierce anticipation that can come along as people get tired of waiting. This is a season of waiting. The word Advent means arrival or coming, and it was a time that the early church set aside to expectantly anticipate the second coming of Christ. We now associate it more with memory of the first coming of Christ, but it still is a time of anticipation of waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. Advent is a season of waiting. And this year, more than any that I can remember, we are all waiting. Waiting for more than we usually do. Some of us are waiting to see extended family and relatives. Some of us are waiting to find out if loved ones will survive a serious illness. We're waiting for the distribution of vaccines and to see their efficacy so that we can start to move on with our lives. We're waiting to go to restaurants. We're waiting to come back and worship in person in the sanctuary. This is a season of waiting. And there's a family in our church that does something interesting with one particular moment of waiting. And I want you to listen as Randy and Tracy Esch share their story about how they wait as a family. Every year at Christmas, on Christmas Eve, we would sleep down by the Christmas tree, wherever that Christmas tree was that year. And we would get our sleeping bags out and all sleep together by the Christmas tree. The earliest I can remember was in 1974, when I lived at home with my family, and we started sleeping down by the fireplace with my brother and my parents. And we would go to Christmas Eve service and come home, get our pajamas on, We'd run downstairs, we would roast marshmallows and hot dogs over the fire, and, and then we'd sleep down by the fireplace. So we've been doing it for many, many years. When we got married, um, you know, I was invited to join the family by the, by the fireplace, and uh, by the, under the tree, really, is where we slept. And as we started having children, 
then the children, you know, stayed there as well, which was interesting some nights because there were some nights where children were crying late into the night. My brother's family and um, our family would both go to my parents' house. We'd go to Christmas Eve service and we'd all sleep down by the fire. There got to be more and more children and there, we were running out of space for them. So soon the children were sleeping underneath the pool table and we had them all over the basement. Um, some years they slept more than others and um, we just had a great family time with my brother's family and my parents. Another tradition that started at this, at this as this kind of progressed was that um, we would have hors d'oeuvres, there would always be snacks, but they kind of kept in getting better every year. And so there started to be these special treats that only came out like at Christmas Eve. And so the kids would start, and we all would start, you know, looking forward to those special snacks every year. And uh, I think soon after we were married, her mother started uh, collecting little prizes throughout the year and little gifts that she would wrap and then we started playing bingo on Christmas Eve while we were kind of waiting till it was you know late enough to actually crawl in your sleeping bags and go to sleep. Yes it was very hard to get everybody settled down we'd have bo and most of the most of them are boys. Cousins are boys. Yeah. So there would be boys flopping on top of each other and cousins rolling from one sleeping bag to another. One year we had one crying all night and they took him for a drive for you know, two in the morning, they left the house to go for a drive to try to get one to fall asleep. So in the early years, it was quite difficult. Then the kids started getting older and um, we wanted to start going to Forest Hills because they were having their own Christmas Eve service and the boys would be involved in the Christmas Eve service somehow. So we stopped going to my parents and we just decided we would continue the um, tradition here and the boys were absolutely, absolutely, we had to continue here. But it is also tradition now that, you know, since that has happened, that at midnight, uh, you call the other family and wish them a, a Merry Christmas. Um, so you're always sure to stay up to at least midnight so you can make that phone call. I don't think the, uh, the anticipation of the gift opening was as great um, or it didn't seem that much because they were enjoying the other things that were happening leading up to that. So they were important things to take place as well. Part of the traditions that we did um, maybe helped to alleviate some of the dire need to dive into the gifts. I have to say I'm impressed by this, not just the fact that this is a nearly 50-year tradition, I'm impressed that grown adults voluntarily leave the comfort of their mattress and go sleep in a sleeping bag. I'm still in my 30s, but I'm far enough into my 30s that if I sleep the wrong way in my mattress, I pay for it for like a week. <laughs> I was out shoveling snow Thursday, I must have slept on my shoulder weird because Friday morning I woke up and I couldn't turn my head past like here. I can do more now, but it actually hurts a little bit. So I'm really impressed that these adults voluntarily go sleep on a hard slab floor with a sleeping bag. This is amazing to me. But isn't it great to fill this time of waiting? You have this time filled with anticipation and waiting. Something is going to happen, but it can't happen yet. Isn't it great to fill this time with purpose? We fill this waiting with purpose. There's something we do while we wait, not merely mired in anticipation and perhaps anxiety about what's going to come, but there's some way that we redeem this time of waiting. Personally, I'm not great at waiting. The time frame that things take get compressed and compressed and compressed, and so we start to expect faster and faster and faster paces of life. We, expect to expect, we, we begin to expect our gratification to come more and more instantaneously. Some of it is driven by technology. But it's not just technology. There's a whole mental attitude, a, a worldview, an assumption that we ought to be acting. There's a political theorist in the mid-19th century who was reflecting on the works of various philosophers who had come before him or been contemporaneous with him, and he said, the philosophers have only analyzed the world in various ways. The point, he said, is to change it. The philosophers have only analyzed the world. The point is to change it. This is a time not for thinking or reflection. This is a time for action. This political theorist's name was Karl Marx. 
And many, many people took this teaching to heart. It wasn't time to reflect or think, to think back on what might happen. It wasn't time to explore possibilities or contingencies of our actions. It was time simply to act. And both Marxists and those who would oppose Marxists uh, took this very seriously. This was the time for action. It wasn't a time for reflection, careful consideration. It wasn't a time for dialogue. It was a time for action. And so the 20th century becomes one of the bloodiest centuries, if not the bloodiest century of human history, because we prioritized action above reflection. More recently, uh, someone who studies Marx and actually identifies himself as a communist or a socialist, Slavo Žižek, said that perhaps this was one of the errors of the early communist attempts. There wasn't enough reflection. There wasn't enough thinking. There wasn't enough philosophy. People were simply acting. And some of us love this, this idea of a bias toward action. This makes sense to us. We actually taunt each other with questions like, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? It's a taunt. You have everything you need. Why don't you act? What are you waiting for? Or sometimes we say, don't just stand there, do something. There's this assumption that the time is almost always right for us to act. Waiting seems like a, an irrelevancy, a distraction, something less than the best. The best is action, and waiting or reflecting or anticipating is not the best. Don't just stand there, we say. Do something. So how surprising is it then that in Scripture, God is depicted as waiting, as having patience. In fact, we read this. It's easy to miss if you're reading Romans 5. There's such rich theological insight here. It's easy to miss uh, what Paul is actually saying where he says that, Je that God sent Jesus into the world at exactly the right time. Read this in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly at the right time. The Greek word underlying this is kairos, and it refers to an opportune moment. And there was this rich metaphorical imagery that grew up in Greco-Roman culture about kairos. And one of the images was of someone running past someone and reaching out at the last second, grabbing them by the hair. At the last possible second, an action that is at exactly the right opportune time. There's patience, there's patience, there's patience, there's waiting, there's waiting, there's waiting, and then there's the opportune moment for action. At exactly the right time, at the kairos moment, Christ died for the ungodly. Which means that this event that we're reflecting on, the entrance of God into the world, God incarnate in the form of Jesus Christ, this happened at exactly the right time. It suggests then that God had been waiting. God had been preparing. God had been anticipating. There was something that needed to happen within the world for this to reach the fullness of time, the proper time, so that God could act and send Christ into the world. Now, we can't say with certainty what it is that God was waiting for. We can speculate for sure. Maybe God was waiting for the Roman road system to be built so that the good news of what God had done through Jesus could travel far and wide. Maybe God was waiting for the consolidation of languages so that everyone was speaking some variant of Greek, not everyone, but enough people were speaking some variant of Greek that the good news of the gospel could be written down and understood across a wide swath of people. Maybe God was waiting for that. Maybe God was waiting for his chosen people, Israel, to reach the fullness of their stubbornness so that more would be ready to accept this unexpected Messiah that was coming into the world. We can't know for sure. We can only speculate. Perhaps it was some combination of all of those, or perhaps it was none of those and something entirely even unimaginable to our finite minds. I don't know what God was waiting for, but God was willing to wait to send Jesus into the world. So if God is willing to wait, and God invites us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, perhaps there is wisdom for us in our capacity, ability, willingness to wait. 
But I don't believe the question is whether or not we will wait, because we will. It's the nature of being human. Not everything will come to us instantaneously. Not everything will arrive on our schedule according to our desires. The question is not will we wait, we will wait. Perhaps the question to be asking is how will we wait? Will we, like the Esch family, find ways to redeem this time, to infuse this time of waiting with something of significance and value and meaning? Or will we numb our minds with the perception of activity, things that feel active but really aren't because we aren't willing to do the hard work of waiting? I want to suggest that there are two opportunities that come through waiting, two things that God can do in us as we wait. And the first has to do with questions of pride. Some of the thought process underlying this bias toward action that so many of us have, this desire to not just stand there but do something, this question of what are we waiting for, don't we have everything we need to act, isn't now the time for action, some of what underlies that is an overinflated sense of our own importance, also known as pride. We believe that the well-being of those close to us, or perhaps even the well-being of the world, is somehow contingent on our own action. We believe that our action is that which will bring about good in the world. And of course we believe that, because many of our actions can bring about good in the world. But when we're caught in this frenetic, endless activity, when we never actually stop and wait, we can begin to think that our actions are the only thing that can bring good into the world. The truth is more sobering. The truth is that it is God's actions that bring good into the world. And yes, God invites us in. God partners with us. God uses us for God's purposes, but the well-being of the world is not entirely contingent on our own actions. And so a willingness to wait invites a different relationship with our own sense of importance, our own pride. A willingness to wait situates us in such a way that we can recognize that the ultimate hope of the world is not my actions or your actions. The ultimate hope of the world is God's actions, and God's actions through Christ are what will ultimately bring restoration and renewal and redemption. Now, this is not an excuse for us to just sit back on our laurels and do nothing. This is an invitation to participate in the mission of God, but to participate humbly, knowing that we ourselves are not fully responsible for all that is good in the world. We ourselves are not fully responsible for the redemption of the world. As we wait, we sometimes begin to see that God is acting independently of us. And it spurs humility, and it spurs hope, and it spurs trust. Waiting gives an opportunity for us to shift our thinking about pride. Waiting also gives an opportunity for us to shift our perspective. You know, I think it's perhaps somewhat easy for the Apostle Paul, living after the birth of Jesus, living after the incarnation, living after the first Christmas, for the Apostle Paul to say that, yes, that was the right time. That was the Kairos moment. God acted, Jesus came, and now we live in the bounty of God's goodness through God's action at the Kairos moment. But what do you say to all those who lived before? What do you say to the Maccabees, for example, who were engaged in what they felt was a holy struggle against imperial domination over the Jewish people, and they were prepared to shed their own blood, believing that if they did so, God would act? And in some ways, God seemed to have acted. They experienced this brief period of independence, but then ultimately are subjected again under Roman domination. Why didn't God act in time for the Maccabees? Why wasn't that the Kairos moment? Or you can rewind even further and think of someone like Bathsheba and what she endured at the hands of God's apparently chosen king, David. Why didn't God act then? Why wasn't that the Kairos moment to send Jesus into the world to fulfill the purpose of the Davidic dynasty, to send the Messiah so that Bathsheba would not have to suffer? Why wasn't that 
the Kairos moment. Or you can think about Ruth and Orpha and their mother-in-law, Naomi, following the death of their husbands, Naomi's sons, and the destitution that they experienced. Why wasn't that the Kairos moment? Why didn't God act then sending Jesus? See, if our perspective is that God's action or inaction, God's faithfulness or unfaithfulness, God's commitment to the covenant or lack of commitment to the covenant can be determined by our own well-being alone. If we say when we are happy, when our life is flourishing, God is being faithful, when we are sad or experiencing difficulty or life is hard, God is not being faithful, then we don't understand the Kairos moment. We don't understand how God acts in time. Because here's one thing that I believe we can say about this Kairos moment that Paul is describing for us. Yes, this was good news and easier to understand good news, easier to comprehend or recognize good news for Paul and his contemporaries, but God is not bound by time the way that you and I are. And so this Kairos moment of sending Jesus into the world, I believe we can say with confidence, was also good news for the Maccabees, for Bathsheba, for Ruth and Orpha and Naomi, for David, for Abraham. God's grace is retroactive back to all of the hardship and difficulty that they experienced. God, through Christ, acting at this Kairos moment, God is able to make all things including the past, new. We catch a little bit of a glimpse of this in the second letter that the apostle Peter wrote. Peter, if you read about him in the Gospels, is someone who knew a thing or two about impatience. He knew a thing or two about how hard it is to wait. He was prone to leap into action and end up doing the wrong thing. And he writes about those who are scoffing at the promise of the Lord's second coming, of this future advent. If the first advent is Christ coming into the world, the second advent is Christ returning to judge the living and the dead. And Peter is recognizing that people are scoffing, saying things like this, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing changes. The philosophers have only interpreted the world, and the point is to change it. Jesus only revealed this one good piece of goodness in the world. Now it falls to us to change it because everything in creation is continuing apace. Everything is still a mess. Where is the promise? Why isn't God acting? And Peter goes on to say this, but do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you. I'll read that again. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you. God is continuing to be patient, even after this Kairos moment, this moment of perfection, when God sends Jesus into the world, God continues to be patient. Why? Not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God continues to wait, and we can't fully explain why, because there are all sorts of things in the world, in this moment, that I would love to see God change. I would love for this to be the exact right opportune time for God to act, for this second advent to happen, for Christ to come and make all things right in ways that you and I can recognize. But God has not chosen to do that. And at least part of the reason is that God is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So as we wait, our perspective changes. We begin to realize that God's redemptive work in the world does not entirely revolve around our own sense of well-being or lack thereof. God's desire is for the redemption and restoration of all things, of all people, of the entire cosmos. And it seems that God is willing to wait as long as it takes for that to happen knowing that the good things that God brings into the world can bring about restoration and renewal even for that which has come in the past. 
God is willing to wait. And so I wonder for each of us in these last few days before Christmas, what are we waiting for? And as we wait, how are we waiting? Are we waiting in such a way that it deals with our pride, with our desire to presume that we are at the center of all the action and activity and that everything is contingent upon what we do or fail to do? Are we waiting in such a way that God can speak to our pride? And are we waiting in such a way that it shifts our perspective so that we recognize that God is not slow about keeping God's promises, but God is patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Perhaps the invitation for us this Advent season is to not just do something, but to stand there, to wait, and to see what God does. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks that you are patient, that you are not slow about keeping your promises, but you are patient, and that at exactly the right time, you sent Christ into the world. And we pray, God, that inspired by your patience and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we would be those who could wait well, allowing you to transform our pride, allowing you to shift our perspective as we wait, knowing that you are faithful. We pray this in the precious name of Christ. Amen.